So i am just been following on when I've been doing these services from the, what was happening in the morning with the children in the Sunday school, and uh, they've been going through Psalms. So last week, if you were here, we did The Lord's My Shepherd. Um, and the psalm we had this morning was Psalm 51, uh, which if you might know is the, the psalm which David prays in response to his sin with David and, and Bathsheba. So David, what went wrong really? What, what was going on? I mean, it, it seems that everything was fine. He'd, uh, he'd loads of success for David. He'd, uh, remember Saul wanted him dead. He thought they could have ended early for, for David. Saul wanted him dead um, and he had to keep running and hiding from him. And, but then he, he becomes king, doesn't he? And uh, he defeats his enemies and he, there he is as in in Israel and Jerusalem, and he, he's, everything's sorted, everything's right, everything's pe- at peace. But then, out of the blue, trouble comes. And uh, the trouble is, 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 is his, own, his own making. Uh, it's like he's decided to dig a hole, and he's kept digging, he's digging himself in a hole, and it gets bigger and bigger, and the pit keeps uh, growing. So it's in, in 2 Samuel chapter 11 when... Uh, it says at the time when kings meant to go to war, David was meant to go to war. David was meant to lead Israel out and back. And instead of doing that, he lets Joab go instead of him. He abdicates his responsibility. And he sees Bathsheba across, doesn't he? And he sees and he takes. There's no um, conversation of consent between uh, David and Bathsheba. And he's the king and he sent for her. So it'd be quite hard to say no. Um, sexual sin is a, um, the, like a gateway drug. You know, it's a drug that leads on to lots of other drugs. Uh, and, and sins like that, it leads on to lots of other sins. So if we went through uh, the Ten Commandments, and how many of the Ten Commandments did David break as he... Well, he committed adultery, didn't he? But that committing adultery, what did it lead to? Say, so lies, was that? Yeah, it led to lying. Murder. Yo, look at that, an echo, like a surround sound there from the front. <laughs> it, led, it, led, yeah, it, led to, it led to murder, didn't it? Yeah. And it was like it was like he was digging, you know, the, you know, the conversation thing, stop digging a hole for yourself. Well, David dug a sin hole, didn't he? And he kept digging and digging. It, it seemed to get worse and spiral out of control. David sinned. Uh, Bathsheba was sinned against. He, he took her, didn't he? And abused her in that way. And chapter 11, verse 27, tells us how the Lord feels about these event, events. The thing David had done displeased the Lord, or was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord was displeased with this. He felt it was evil in his sight. And this is how um, God feels about, his, about victims of sin. So it's, we can think about how David felt as the, uh, as the perpetrator of the sin, but we can also see how Bathsheba might have felt as being a victim uh, of sin herself as well. And we see Nathan the prophet comes along and speaks to David and tells this story of, the, of lambs and how one got stolen and taken and killed. And David's outrage is now a mirror for how God would be outraged for those who have been sinned against. And that's in chapter 12, and I'm going to read verse uh, 5 and 6. And this is David speaking when he's... Uh, Actually, I'll read the the whole bit of when Nathan comes to rebuke David. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had brought. He raised it and grew it with him and his children. It shared his food and drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had came to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had came to him. Then it comes into verse 5 and 6. This is how David's reaction to that story. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, Surely as the Lord lives, this man deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. That's how the Lord felt about David's sin. It's how the Lord felt on behalf of Bathsheba and on behalf of Uriah. Some of us 
known what it is to be sinned against. Well, actually, all of us know what it is to be sinned against, don't we? And some of us even know what it is to be abused. And this is how the Lord feels for, for those who are abused. That this day, the way David spoke here, he is burns with anger against it. Righteous anger. And then in, in verse 10 as well. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Consequences from the Lord because of the abuse of David. So there are consequences and we see later on in the story as the story unfolds those consequences uh, full carry on. But we see there's a simple repentance that happens in the story on David's part. So chapter 12 again and uh, verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You'd think though, if you were the victim, you would want more, wouldn't you, than that? Um, we went with the kids this morning, we, we um, basically we went through and said, well, what sins are worse? And we started off with, um, oh, someone bumps into you. Someone steals your, cho- sorry, steals your toy. Uh, someone eats your chocolate. Uh, what, what's, what's, or someone steals your pet. <laughs> and someone burns down your house. Now, you would, want, you would probably, probably feel upset if you went back to your home and it was burnt down. Some of you might be happy, I don't know. It depends on the state of your home. Uh, but, 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 you know, the, or someone stole our pet. Or some of us would be more outraged if someone just ate our chocolate, wouldn't they? I mean, you know, we have different levels of outrage on different, on different levels, don't we? But some things are more outrageous than others, aren't they? And here David's sin is clearly outrageous. So we would have thought for the response that David says, I have sinned against the Lord. We would want some more for his repentance, wouldn't we? We would want some tears... We would want some, you know, something, just something more. But it's a simple, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. Now, we don't always see what's going on in a man's heart, do we, from that simple repentance that we have of David here. But there is grace on offer for David, and there's grace on offer for Bathsheba. And because... We both, all of us, the vic- those of us who are victims, we all are victims at times, and those of us who are perpetrators, and we're all perpetrators at times, we all need God's grace. And God's grace is receiving what we don't deserve. And we come as broken people. We're broken by our sin against others, and other times we're broken by other people's sin against us. But the way that we receive grace from God is we come as broken people. And we come recognising our brokenness and recognising our hand in our brokenness. And that context is the context where David uh, wrote Psalm 51, which goes like this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inmost parts. Teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast your presence from me or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Uh, Cleanse me with hyssop. Now hyssop would have been the same way that it was used in the Passover to take the blood and place it on the doorposts. So the idea of cleansing me with hyssop would would be a a picture looking back to the Passover where the blood of the lamb was spilt for grace and forgiveness to flow and the passing over of death for the people of God in Egypt. But there's that refrain in there, isn't it? 
Create in me a pure heart, O God. If we'd imagine for a moment that Jesus was our waiter this evening, and that's the way Jesus came to the world, didn't he? He came as a servant, uh, not to be served, but to serve. And we've all got cups, uh, wine glasses or cups. And, and Jesus is the waiter, and he's going around, and he's wanting to top up our cups. And into our t- cups, he would top up love, wouldn't he? And joy and peace and goodness and mercy. And he's round, ready to pour into each of our cups. But Jesus, the waiter, will only pour into clean cups. But here we are, and what do we have? We have dirty cups. We have cups that have been broken and, 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 not, and not clean, not cups that we'd want to drink from. But Jesus wants to pour these good things into our hearts, yet he can't. He can't because he can't pour into these dirty cups. You can only pour when you've got a clean cup. How do you wash? <laughs> How do you wash? Well, you use water, don't you, I guess? <laughs> I don't know if anyone washes themselves in, in alcohol gel yet, but you, you wash with water and soap, don't you? And if you always want to clean your hands, you can use that, that gel, can't you? But that's how we can. But how do you clean your heart? Jesus is saying, I want to pour these good things in your life, but I can only pour it into a clean heart. How do you clean your heart? Well, it's, it's the refrain's given us create in me or give me a pure heart, oh God. So, to be filled with all those good things from Christ, Christ has to cleanse us, to purify us, and then we can receive. So often, we want just some good things from God, don't we? We want peace or grace or mercy, but we need a cleansing before we can receive. And that's why we're encouraged to keep coming back to the communion table, keep coming back to the sacrifice which purifies, the cross which purifies us from all unrighteousness. We're purified, then we receive. I don't know if you've ever had a wound or a a physical one, but if you have a wound, what you need to do is, is keep it covered, don't you? The only time you would uncover the wound is to clean it and rebandage it, and then it's covered up again, isn't it? God wants us to bring our wounds before him. And that could be vulnerable, can't it? We, you know, we normally want to cover up our wounds, but that's how we receive a cleansing from the Lord. We come in our brokenness, we come in our pain, we come in our sin, we come admitting our wrongdoing, and then God purifies us and then fills us with his spirit. That's how it works, that's how, how God does these things, and he's made it possible because of the cross. The cross it's a welcome to us and it welcomes broken, hurting, sinful people. Come and receive the grace of God. So as we come to the Lord's table, the question we'd have, and as we come to eat and to drink this bread, which the bread represents the Christ's body and the, the blood, the wine is his blood, who should come to the Lord's table? Here's the answer. Those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their remaining weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ. Those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their remaining weakness is covered by the suffering of Christ. So if that's you, That's what you're to do this evening. We're to come and to eat. So now as we come to that time where we eat and and we drink together, I'm going to pray and give thanks for the bread and then we'll we'll eat the bread. Heavenly Father, we hear David's heart of confession as he prays before you and as he recognises his brokenness and and he prays, Surely I was sinful at birth. And against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So we can pray along with David. Lord, we know there's a brokenness in us which leads to sin. And we know that we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there was a man who came who did not sin. Who wasn't sinful from birth who didn't sin against the Lord, but had sin placed on his shoulders. 
And Jesus, you went to the cross and became sin for us and bore it away that you might give us your heart, a pure heart, and we can receive the good things of God because of what you've done for us. Lord, yes, we understand what it means to say, Lord, take my heart, and we pray prayers like that. But Lord, more than that, would you give us your heart, a pure heart, a purified heart, a heart that is good and right and loves justice and mercy and wants to walk humbly with you. So as we eat this bread, we pray Lord, take our confession, take our sin, and create in us a pure heart. In Jesus' name we pray.